14. That's the number of Democrats now running for president. Here's that group photo from a moment ago. We still expect this to get more crowded. Today, we're focused on the man in the second row all the way to the right. Uh, this is the only chance you'll ever get to vote for a Maltese American left-handed Episcopalian gay war veteran, Mayor Millennium. <laughs> Did you get that? His name is Pete Buttigieg and he stood above the crowd in Davenport on Monday. He's 37 years old and the youngest in the race for president, the first millennial candidate. Buttigieg graduated from Harvard with a degree in history and literature. He earned a graduate degree from Oxford in philosophy, politics and economics as a Rhodes Scholar. He served with the Navy Reserve in Afghanistan. Buttigieg then went on to work in consulting for McKinsey and Company. Politically, he's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He's had that job since 2011 and announced, though, he won't seek a third term. He lost in 2010 to be Indiana's state treasurer and lost in 2017 in a bid to chair the Democratic National Committee. Pete Buttigieg is the first openly gay candidate to run for president. Now, forget that he has a last name that's pronounced nothing like it's spelled. He brings some ideas to the table that are different than his Democratic counterparts. I sat down with him earlier this week to talk about them. And there are a lot of firsts that go along with Pete Buttigieg. One is trying to be the first mayor to go directly to the White House. South Bend is the 301st largest city in the country by population, about the same as here in Davenport. How do you think you're qualified to go from being the mayor there to the leader of the most powerful country in the world? Well, look, I understand the audacity of somebody in my position, or really any position seeking that office. I mean, the truth is nobody is fully experienced on day one, but you bring the experiences that you have. And I would argue the experiences of an American mayor of a city of any size right now are highly relevant. Look, you could be a very senior United States uh, member of Congress or the Senate. And, and have there are a lot of those running, yes. Yeah, and, and you could be in that position and have never in your life managed more than 100 people. Uh, I believe that the executive on the ground experience, and, and maybe there's something to be said also for experience from the middle of the country, that that's what we need more of in Washington right now. And the truth is, I have more years of government experience under my belt than the president. I have more executive experience than the vice president. I have more military experience than anybody to walk and sit behind that desk since George H.W. Bush. So Democrats would say that's a low bar, though. Democrat, your fellow Democrats would say that. I wouldn't say it's a low bar to say that I have more military experience than No, comparing than to, anybody. let's say, Oh, yeah, sure, president. he's lowered the bar in all according kinds of ways. According to the <clears throat> Yeah, but I would argue, again, that uh, somebody who's got a track record of guiding a city, at this moment when everybody's saying that our part of the country uh, has to turn back the clock, that the only way to reach us is through resentment and nostalgia. Uh, you know, the story of South Bend and, and so many other cities here in the heartland, I think is a very powerful response to that. And I, I want more people to hear that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But first of all, back to this the whole mayor thing. No mayor has ever gone directly from the, from the mayor's office to the White House. Only one actually eventually became the party's nominee, and that was more than 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this can be different, especially with 14 in the race now? and political heavyweights among them. Well, I think the more people you get in the race, the more evidence there is that people aren't satisfied with two or three choices. And <clears throat> they're not looking for the conventional right now. The idea that you need to marinate in Washington and absorb the ways of Washington for 10 or 20 or 40 years, I'm just not sure that uh, that's speaking to where people are right now. You know, frankly, I think my generation needs to be the one that's putting forward leadership. You know, I was in high school when the Columbine shooting happened. I belong to the school shooting generation. And mine is the generation that's going to be de dealing with climate change for the rest of our lives. We're gonna be on the business end of some of these reckless tax cuts that were just passed through. Uh, and we stand to be economically, potentially, the first generation in American history to be worse off than our parents, unless something is done to change that. So why wouldn't our generation now be putting forward leadership too? I mean, we contributed most of the troops after 9-11, including me, uh, why shouldn't we be contributing more political leaders too. Well, thanks for the making me feel old with a Columbine reference, by the <laughs> way. Um, you do talk about a historically or your experience that you've been able to politically capitalize by winning by losing. What about somebody that might say that this is really an opportunity for you to win by losing, maybe getting a vice presidential nod or just a cabinet position. That's all you're really out for. We're talking about the American presidency. And I don't believe in running for an office so that you can have some other office. Uh, I've run for office several times. Uh, I've lost some and I've won some. Uh, when I ran for re-election in the city of South Bend after a challenging four years of ups and downs, I got re-elected with 80% of the vote. Uh, I believe that what I'm bringing to this conversation is what we need. More voices from a new generation, more voices from the heartland, more people with executive experience, and mayors, local government officials, who are prepared to make the case that we need Washington to start looking more like our best-run cities and towns, not the other way around. You consider yourself a progressive Democrat. 
Uh, Bernie Sanders, who you admire as a democratic socialist, what differentiates the two of you? Well, look, I, I have a somewhat different message and I represent a very different messenger. But what I do appreciate about him and a lot of other people in the conversation uh, is that they say what they're for. And I think we need more of that. You don't have to agree with somebody to admire people who come into the public space and talk Where do you straightforwardly. Disagree? What's Where that? do you disagree with it, Senator? Well, you know, before you even get into policy issues, I think we need to just talk about building an inclusive politics, that, that we have a style that bridges to together values that unite us as Americans. Now, I don't believe that involves pretending to be any more conservative than I am, but I, I do believe that it's important, especially at a moment when, frankly, my party has struggled to connect here in the heartland. And I think there are a lot of people in communities uh, like here and communities like where I live in northern Indiana who sometimes feel like the Democratic Party is talking down to them. Uh, we've got to make sure that we get out of that mode if we want to build bridges and build a, a, an American coalition, including, in my view, a generation coalition uh, of people my parents age and people my age and younger who want to see America look better by the time we get to 2054 which is when I'll get to the current age of the current president. I read along the same lines that you don't think the Democratic Party should revert to a centrist platform necessary to win in 2020. Why though if the country is basically considered to be made up of people in the center? Well it depends what we mean by center. There are a lot of positions that are in the center of the American public but not the center of the American Congress. Take universal background checks. 80% of Republicans believe this is a good idea, and yet it's not considered a centrist position because the U.S. Congress can't get it done. The center of the American people believe that we should have a higher minimum wage. They believe that we should have paid family leave. Uh, they believe that uh, we should have comprehensive immigration reform. I don't believe there's anything particularly wild-eyed or leftist about those ideas, and yet by the standards of Washington, they're not considered centrist. So when we say centrist, do we mean centrist by the metrics of the political pundits who just check how close or how far our positions are from the Republicans? Or is it based on what the American people actually want? Because I think if we look at what Americans actually believe, uh, we'll often find that it's a very progressive message. My conversation with Pete Buttigieg didn't end there. Coming up, High Court overhaul, how he would change the Supreme Court for the record.